Welcome to worship at St. Paul's Lutheran Church on the fifth Sunday in Lent. Next week begins Palm Sunday and Holy Week, and so we encourage you to invite friends and family to tune in online or to join us in person, trying to develop that culture of invitation. Services on Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday are some of people's uh, most cherished and also most unique services of the year, so I encourage you to come out or tune in if you can then as well. Now let us join in worship. Almighty God, you alone can bring into order the unruly wills and affections of sinners. Grant your people grace to love what you command and desire what you promise, that among the swift and varied changes of the world, our hearts may surely there be fixed where true joys are to be found. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Everything they do shall prosper. 
It is not so with the wicked. They are like chaff which the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked shall not stand upright when judgment comes, nor the sinner in the counsel of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked shall be hear our psalm today it was so clear the wicked are like shaft which the wind blows away the wicked shall not stand the way of the wicked shall be destroyed would that the demise of the wicked was so obvious my sermon today plunges us into some of the most disturbing questions that life can raise Take Jesus' words in the Sermon on the Mount. God makes his son rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. And to think that Jesus just tossed those words out on his way to something else, loving one's enemies, which was the key message in chapter five of Matthew. Jesus asserts two convictions here. First. The universe is essentially moral. Jesus was not a materialist, did not reduce life to mere physical or biological terms. He didn't blind himself to the facts of evil and injustice, the terms good and evil, just and unjust. Think about it, they're only possible if one sees the universe as moral. As that brilliant Jewish scholar Abraham Heschel put it, even the cry there is no justice is a cry in the name of justice, a cry that could not come out of us if it did not come from a source bigger than ourselves. But Jesus also affirms his belief that God actively sustains life. God sends his reign on the good and the bad. God makes his son to rise on the just and the unjust. Now there are many who prefer to get God out of any direct participation. We prefer to speak of the laws of nature or we take refuge in such terms as the weather man or mother earth or mother nature. You hear the news with all the tragedy and hurricanes and tornadoes. And then we have the deists going back to Thomas Jefferson and before and certainly in our own day who find it easier to invoke secondary sources and place them between us and God. If we could remove God, there would be no problem. If we could simply say, it rains, it shines, it happens, no problem. But Jesus clearly put God in the picture and there's the rub. I've been amazed these last few days at the daffodils, yellow and green against the blue sky. But if I couldn't say thank you to anything bigger than myself, what a terrible deprivation. And there's the rub. Let's face it. We'd like it best if God were more discriminating, if he honored the good in life and put down the evil. We would prefer a more discernible connection between a person's character and circumstances. No nonsense about it. We'd like it better if Psalm 1 were more empirically verifiable, if the wicked perish quickly before our very eyes, it would be easier to believe. But life doesn't come to us like that. A few weeks ago, I had a haircut in Florida. I was aware the barber had been in a bad automobile accident. He told me about it. He was moving very slowly. The young man that hit him had been drinking. And then the cell phone, his cell phone rang and he apologized and came back and told me it was his sister in a nursing home. 
He told me when she was 19 that she had been badly burned. One of her children had died in the fire and all of the consequences medically of that burn was still with her decades later. The very next day, on an Uber drive to Fort Myers, the driver told me that he lost a neighbor the night before. He lived about, oh, 25 miles um, east of Port Charlotte, out in rural Florida, and he said his neighbor just a a lovely couple, no children, really no relatives, and they were out in a golf cart and some car ran into the back of the golf cart and killed the wife. And now this man in his 70s was all alone and it all happened in a second. In an instant, his life was turned upside down. If I broke you into small groups for five minutes and had you share similar experiences in your life or those around you, I am convinced that every one of you would be able to share similar stories. If only life made more sense and bad things didn't happen so often to good people. But we live in a world where Jesus dies at 33 and Pilate lives to a ripe old age. All hoodlums do not die young, nor do all saints live to comb gray hair together. The heavens can rain out a church school picnic as well as a lawn party of the mafia. Lightning can strike a church as well as a brothel. It's hard to know what a blessing is and what's a curse? We hear our late night comedians open their monologues by saying, I have good news for you and bad news. Providence is so blasted ambiguous. Man meets a friend and he says, I just won $10,000. And the friend says, that's good. No, I spent it on a skiing trip in Switzerland and I broke a leg, that's bad. No, well, in the hospital, I fell in love with this attractive nurse and married her. Ah, oh, that's good. No, it turned out she didn't like the United States and insisted on living in Europe. That's bad. No, we set up a home in Paris and I got a job at an export firm. Wow, that's good. No, the firm went bankrupt and we were soon reduced to poverty. That's bad. No, under these strange circumstances, I was forced to re-examine my goals and values, and I discovered I was living for all the wrong reasons. That's good. No, my wife didn't share these views. We grew further and further apart. Oh, that's bad. No, our marital troubles, we turned to an able counselor who led us to discover a shared vision. It brought us closer together. We discovered the presence of God in our lives. That's good. No, our newfound faith and the recentering of our home caused us to lose most of our secular friends in Paris and led to a rift between her parents and us. That's bad. That's good. That's bad. That's good. That's bad. And so it goes. Most of you are old enough to remember old Leo DeRosha, that feisty manager of the Dodgers. Nice guys finish last. That's how we titled a book. But is there anyone in this house today who wants to come forward and defend the thesis that nice guys finish first? There is no infallible, clearly visible correlation between character and circumstance. He makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. Maybe it's so we can be good for nothing, that is, good for the right reasons, that love is self-restricting when it comes to power. And I confess I've been struggling with this topic all my life. And one word that gives me hope and encouragement is the word anticipation. The Georgetown theologian John Haught, who was here a few years ago, he comes out with a new book every few years, and I, I think he wouldn't mind my saying that I think all these recent books have 
been improvisations on the theme of anticipatory vision. We live in an unfinished universe. Anticipation does not insist on perfect clarity or absolute certitude here and now. He says, anticipation can live with ambiguity. And he quotes the French Jesuit paleontologist de Chardin in his most recent book, where Chardin writes, our world contains within itself a mysterious promise of the future. The universe is an unfinished story. Beauty is the harmony of contrast. The universe is not fixed, frozen, unbending, always on the move. The Jesuit poet Gerard Manley Hopkins loved spring, but Teilhard loved fall because it reminded him that the universe is coming into blossom. The universe is a cosmic awakening still in progress, becoming conscious of itself. Wednesday night at our soup supper, at our table after, after we, we ate, one of our members shared with me this wonderful quote by the former CEO of IBM. Growth and comfort do not coexist. Think about that. Growth and comfort do not coexist. Hot could write a whole book on that. And this is our hope, that God is in our future as well as in our present. God is actively involved in the ambiguities of life in our present and in our future. In the language of scripture, payday will come. We have a rendezvous with judgment. Be not deceived. St. Paul reminds us in Galatians chapter six, God is not mocked. What we sow, we reap. Love's labor is never lost, so let us not grow weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart, always keeping heaven in our eye and earth under our feet. Our psalm you might call an eschatological hope. There's an old story of a missionary who spent his whole life in missionary service overseas. It so happened he returned to the United States on the same ship that carried Teddy Roosevelt, who was coming back from a rambling safari in Africa. When the ship came near to New York City, flags, banners, and streamers were everywhere in sight. Firefighting boats were spraying their welcome toward the sky. It was all for the president, of course. And this humble missionary remembered all he had tried to do in China and how little anyone had cared. And he folded his hands and leaned on the deck rail, feeling sorry for himself. And a voice came to him like the sound of waters and said, you're not home yet. This is our hope. And it's the hope of the gospel. We're not home yet. 3.8 billion years ago, a big bang, 30 volumes, if you wish, and we appear on the last few sentences of the last page of the 30th volume. God and future belong together. I believe that. We're not home yet. But how can we be sure that ambiguity is not the beginning and the end, as well as the middle of things. How do we cope with that uncertainty that we face every day? I believe that we only know as we go. We only know as we go. One foot in front of the other. I have in my office that word from Isaiah, those who love the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And someone said it's backwards. In real life, we start crawling and then, and then we walk and then we run and then we fly. But John Claypool, after losing a 12-year-old daughter, wrote about it and he said, maybe the real strength in life is putting one foot in front of the other. 
Maybe it's not flying or running. It's facing each day with an anticipatory vision that God isn't finished with us yet. We only know as we go. New and unpredictable things have been happening in our universe for billions of years, including the recent arrival of inquiring minds, consciousness. You're not home yet. We live in an unfinished creation. God is working still. The psalmist says, weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. This is our faith, that God is more omega than alpha, less up above and more up ahead. I love the way the theologian Paul Tillich defines providence, the enigma, the mystery of providence. This is what he writes. Providence does not mean a divine efficient machine. Rather, providence means that there is a creative and saving possibility implied in every situation which cannot be destroyed by any event. A creative and saving possibility implied in every situation which cannot be destroyed by any event. That's our anticipatory vision. In the meantime, he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, sends rain on the just and on the unjust. Someday, he'll make it plain.
salvation. O oh God, as we remember in these days of Lent what the doing of love involves, we pray forgiveness for the hesitancy with which we face small problems, knowing comfort and growth cannot coexist. Give us strength to do boldly the large tasks which love requires, Lord, in your mercy. O oh God, today we remember Patrick, apostle to the Irish people, and how you called him to love the land of his captivity, to spend willingly and be spent that he might bring his people to you. Grant that in all our troubles we may hear your voice and gladly learn what you would have us do. Lord, in your mercy. For all we know of you, O God, and for all you are, which is beyond our knowing, we give thanks. Make plain to us each day your will with so much of your love as shall hold us and so much of your strength as shall be level to our need. Lord, in your mercy. Hear us as we pray for those in need and name them now before you. Lord, in your mercy. Hear us as we remember those whom we've loved and lost, as names and faces rush to mind. Hear us as we remember them. They are still so dear to us. Lord, in your mercy. All these words, however broken, we offer you through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whose table we prepare now to come. Amen. We are bold to say, Our, Our Father, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.